so I thought this would be a good opportunity just to provide a, a very brief overview of ILRF, some of ILRF's work in China. And to do it in the context of some of the questions that we've been talking about today, we, we, we see that we have an increasing m mobility of capital worldwide and changing relations between workers and their employers. And workers are struggling to figure out ways in which they can respond to changing relationships at the workplace. And uh, China is no different. We, we talked about contracted workers uh, in Latin America or contracted workers here in the United States. And China, Chinese workers are, are faced with some of the same, same problems. And I thought I'd be able to give uh, some background on what ILRF has been doing in China just by also providing some context in terms of the current, the current conditions for, for workers in China. Um, particularly, a lot of ILRF's work focuses on migrant labor in China. And when we talk about migrant labor, for the most part, we usually talk about international migration. That's sort of usually how we discuss it. In, in, in China, when we refer to migrant workers, these are, are, are Chinese citizens. These are individual Chinese peasants that migrate from the countryside into the cities in, in search of work. Um, and due to the Chinese system, uh, the household registration system, it's referred to as the HUCO system, uh, the Chinese government um, connects an individual's place of birth with their access to uh, education benefits for their children, access to social insurance benefits, or even access to, to housing allotments. So. The, a, a large majority of, of Chinese workers have migrated from the countryside into the cities in search of work, yet are considered to be second-class citizens in, in a lot of these cities which they have helped build. Um, Chinese migrant workers are also a, a key component of the labor class, or the, the labor class in China. They constitute anywhere between uh, a fifth to a quarter of the, of the Chinese labor force. Um, and they're also concentrated in very important sectors of the Chinese economy, such as construction and manufacturing. Um, the Financial Times recently referred to as the construction sector in China as the most important sector in the world's economy. Uh, it it Im impacts everything from Chinese domestic consumption to uh, international commodities prices. Uh, about 90 percent of construction workers in China are migrant workers. Um, China is often considered the sort of heartland of manufacturing, the world's manufacturer in, in the Pearl River Delta. Uh, the vast major majority of workers in manufacturing in China are migrant workers coming from, from the countryside into the cities. So migrant labor constitute, uh, constitutes a very important component of, of the Chinese working class. Um, and although the Chinese, the past three decades of Chinese economic reform has significantly changed the, the structure of the relationship between workers and employers or it, it, uh, employers and workers in, in China. Um, and it's provided new opportunities for workers to come to the, to the cities in search of work. But at the same time, it's created a number of complex relationships between workers and, and their employers. And I just want to focus on two problems that I think, the reason I chose these is because I think they're very similar to the problems that, that we've heard um, taking place in, in other situations in, in the world. Uh, one is the use of uh, labor dispatch companies. Uh, I think they're, in, in the Philippines, they might, they might be referred to as manpower companies. Um, and, and this is a very common phenomenon in a number of different countries. In, in Chinese, it, they're to be referred to as pai qian gong se, uh, labor dispatch companies. And one of the problems is you have companies, these are, these are, these are corporations, these are companies that provide workforces to manufacturer, manufacturers or uh, construction firms. But what happens is because Chinese uh, social protections and, and, and benefits are determined at the local level, at the level of the city, you'll have a, com a, a company that's based, uh, a um, labor dispatch company, for example, that's based in a small third tier, tier city in northern Guangdong province in the Pearl River Delta, for example. And they'll supply workers to factories in Guangzhou, which is one of the largest cities in the country. Um, and because the workers sign contracts or are forced to sign contracts with the labor dispatch company in northern Guangdong province where the, the cost of living and the benefits scales are much lower, that's the benefit scales that they're used when they're provided with, with insurance and benefits and, and those types of things. And so even though workers have never been to that third tier city, that's, that's the sort of system that they use. Um, another problem is their ability to access uh, health care benefits, for example, to see a doctor, for example, is, is based on um, the fact that they signed a contract with a labor dispatch company in another city. So I've, I've, I've heard of workers that our partners have talked to us about that have signed or forced to sign contracts with these third parties, and that influences their access to, to pay and benefits. And, and they say, you know, I've never even been to this city. I couldn't find it on a map. 
um, but because of my my interaction with this third party that that disconnects me from my employer who's actually receiving my work then then this creates a problem um, another problem are our use of labor contractors and this is a situation in which uh, this is sort of a very traditional uh, labor relationship in China where you'll have individuals will guarantee to provide workers primarily in construction um, to do a set period of projects on a construction site but very often the, the the workers have only a relation a labor relationship with this uh, individual independent labor contractor they have no ser they have no formal relationship with the actual construction company where they're doing the work and so it's it, it can be very easy for labor contractors for example if they're paid by the construction company and they're supposed to be they're supposed to distribute the wages to their to their contractors or their 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 em employees for example their workers excuse me it can be very easy for the labor contractors to just simply take the wages and, and abscond with workers' pay. And because workers have a very tenuous relationship to that construction company, it's hard for them to receive their, their benefits, it's hard for them to, to, to receive any sort of compensation for this exploitation. The ironic thing about both these problems is there are decent laws on the books in China that protect workers' rights in both these instances. It's illegal. Uh, under Chinese law to directly distribute wages for construction workers to labor contractors. Um, there are also conditions under Chinese labor law, the labor contract law, and the new social insurance law, which came out in 2011, which um, better uh, delineate the relationship between workers and, and their employers and, and the benefits and the pay that, that they're provided. Um, very often, though, despite the fact that there are, there are good laws on the books, um, very often these laws are not implemented in practice. And so this is where uh, ILRF's University Labor Law Clinic programs uh, come in. And this is where we're, we're hoping to, to, to help to empower workers to protect their own rights under the law. Uh, we've been working traditionally in uh, a number of places with a number of universities in mainland China, in Suzhou, in Xi'an, um, and now recently in Anhui and Chengdu and Nanjing. And these are places in, in the east coast outside Shanghai in the Yangtze River Delta and in, in central China in Xi'an and Chengdu. These places are important because, you know, we talked about the Pearl River Delta being sort of China's manu workshop of the world and, and the predominant place for the destination for a lot of these migrant workers. Well, as we've seen over the past very recently two or three years as wages have, have, have risen in the in South China we've seen a lot of those um, jobs move into central and western China and so what ILRF does is by working with some of these universities to develop labor law clinics in these areas we're hoping to help increase workers legal rights consciousness um, at the same time that those jobs are 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 developing those in those regions so so what do I, exactly do these these uh, clinics do well by partnering with these universities what we try and do is on one hand we hope to provide free legal representation. Well, we, we, we don't hope to. We provide free legal representation to workers in these regions. Um, very often, workers can't afford a lawyer. If they can afford a lawyer, lawyers very often don't want to take labor law cases because it's not particularly, it's not a very lucrative um, case for, for lawyers in China to take on. Very often, it can be politically sensitive. So we provide workers with free legal representation to take their cases to labor arbitration in the court system and to help provide compensation to these workers in case of labor exploitation, such as the two examples that I talked about. On the other hand, another thing that, uh, another component of this university labor law clinic is to actually train uh, law school students to be the next generation of labor lawyers in China. And so they, they, they receive sort of this free clinical legal education, which is very common in the United States. It's not particularly common in China for uh, individual law school students to have the responsibility of taking on cases, uh, working with the workers to develop a case, collect evidence, take that case through labor arbitration or through the, the first or second instances of review in the court system. And we provide the, the, the students that go through ILRF's funded university labor law clinics with this opportunity, with this experience to do this in the hopes that they develop the skills to be better labor lawyers in the future. And we've, we've been very successful so far in taking, uh, I guess you would call them alumni from university labor law clinics and helping them to be placed in local level university, or excuse me, government positions in, in the local labor bureau or in local um, law firms and areas where they can continue on in their career to help protect workers' rights under the Chinese law. And, and just very briefly, um, 
we, we, we've been relatively successful. We've taken on, in these five areas, hundreds of cases for workers. We've helped to, to re help workers to retrieve millions in, in Renminbi in owed compensation from, from labor exploitation. And we've helped to, to, to train and to staff you know, hundreds of what we hope to be the next generation of, of labor lawyers in China. So that's just a, without going over my time, that's just a very sort of brief overview of some of the work that, that the International Labor Rights Forum is doing in China. And it sort of falls within this general conversation that we're having about what are the what are the problems face, facing workers worldwide, and how do we re react to these these very similar problems in ways that the specific conditions in the countries in which we work allow us to do so? So, thank you. Thank you.